at Four River Smokehouse for a limited time. Take $5 off on orders of $25 or more when ordering in-store or by phone when you mention Gators Breakdown. Want more Gators Breakdown? Join Gators Breakdown Plus. Starting at $3 a month, get access to unique episodes, plus a blog, chat room, giveaways, shout-outs, and more. Gators Breakdown Plus is furthering the interaction with fans and listeners like you. Head to gatorsbreakdown.supportingcast.fm to join Gators Breakdown Plus today. Gators Breakdown, because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Here we are, Florida, Tennessee week. Not what it used to mean, but still big, still big for the Gators, of course, especially after last week. Needing to keep it going, keep some momentum out of... uh, Close loss to Alabama, of course. Uh, but you know, we'll find out a lot about this team this week. Is can you take some momentum out of that game? It was a loss. There were some good, there were some bad. Take the good and build on it. And that's what we want to see from the Gators this week when Tennessee rolls into town to take on the Gators in the swamp Saturday night under the lights. Been been a while since we've had Tennessee under the lights there since 2005, I believe. Uh, there. So that creamsicle orange. Rolls, I guess. Is that what you call it? Is that what you call Tennessee orange cream circle orange? I don't know. I know, you know the, the Bucks like to have that cream circle orange too. So uh, if you're a Bucks Gator fan, you probably don't want to call it cream circle, but there we go. Anyway, that's what I'll call it. Uh, but let's just call it Tennessee orange. That's something we can all agree on. It's not the best orange, not the best orange. But uh, yeah, Jason Swain, former Tennessee wide receiver, will join us here on Gators Breakdown as we get his thoughts on the Tennessee Volunteers. Uh, every, you know, two and one on the season, have that loss to Pitt. So no really good wins on the season yet. Uh, but they can change their narrative. Uh, Josh Heupel can build something if he's able to upset Florida in his first Florida-Tennessee matchup. So, yeah, Jason Swain, I'm telling you, he knows the, the ball. He used to play there, so he, know, he knows him, knows that wide receiver core very well as the former uh, receiver there. So we'll get his thoughts on these Tennessee Volunteers. Proud to be joined by Jason Swain, former Tennessee wide receiver from 2003 to 2006. So give us a look at these Tennessee Volunteers rolling into the swamp this Saturday night. Jason, man, thanks for uh, thanks for hopping on. Absolutely, thanks for having me. Jason, let's get to it, man. Uh, out goes Jeremy Pruitt. In comes Josh Heupel. Now we have spring camp. We have fall camp. Three games into the season now. What's the uh, general feel of the head man in charge so far? Well, the, I mean, the culture is more positive. Um, you should never have to. Uh, compliment players for playing hard, but that's been the case. The guys just were unhappy. Uh, the culture from the coaching staff all the way down to the players just wasn't where it needed to be last year. And there seems to be a correction in that area with the coaching staff. Um, that culture is, is better. They're working together as one. Uh, they're communicating. They're on the same page. And then from the player standpoint, uh, you're getting players stepping up and being accountable. And guys are, are enjoying each other and playing playing hard. It's something that uh, we've seen on, on film the first three games and in person. So that's really been the biggest difference. What's been the, like, philosophical change? You mentioned the culture, and that's, to me, you know, <laughs> that had to be topic number one for Tennessee to change that culture around a little bit. But as far as uh, on the field, you know, schematically, like how – how big of a change is it for Tennessee going from what Jeremy Pruitt and, and his staff was doing to what Josh Heupel and his staff is bringing to the table? Yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge change. I remember when uh, Pruitt came in town and, and Jacob Bourne starting to tight end, number 87. I mean, he, he was, a, was a smaller guy receiving type of tight end, and uh, he had just committed to Tennessee uh, under, you know, the Coach Jones regime. And so he comes in. You know, I think he's going to catch a lot of balls and play this spread offense. Well, you know, Pruitt did the opposite when he came in. He won a tight end that was going to block first and uh, you know, was probably going to catch the ball a lot there. And uh, he had to kind of play this turn. And now uh, he is one of the leading receivers on the team. He's already called touchdown. And uh, he's been a very integral piece to this to this offense. So 
Um, just from an X's and O standpoint, it's been a huge difference. We've had several offensive linemen uh, lose weight and get in better shape, probably the best shape they've been in um, as far as conditioning-wise because, you know, this football team wants to snap the football um, quick, fast, and hurry. They want to put up 70, 80 plays a game. So uh, it's been a huge, huge difference. All right, two and one so far on the season. Wins over Bowling Green, Tennessee Tech. Uh, lost to Pitt in the second game of the season. What's been the uh, the general theme of the team so far? Of, you know what they what they're bringing to the table. You, you mentioned the speed and the tempo. That, that that's number one. Uh, is it? Uh, you mentioned the culture as well. Is it? Uh, is it something you just seen this team uh, just along the way having to figure out things on the way in these first three games? Yeah, I mean. I think the most the most important glaring thing here is you know the quarterback play, uh, a place where you know Peyton Manning played, and <laughs> a place where um, you know you, T. Martin who just you know got a statue put up. You know you 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 would think that Tennessee would have a quarterback issue for this long. You know it's pretty natural when you when you lose out on a guy like a Tim Tebow or you know Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields after. You know, they had a three, four-year run, and then you try to replace him uh, the next year. We've seen that there for with Jeff Driscoll trying to step in. And, mm-hmm. You know, that's understandable. But for Tennessee, it's been – I mean, it's been five years, I mean, since Josh Dobbs suited up for Tennessee. So, uh, that's been the, probably the most frustrating thing. Uh, the first couple of games for Tennessee, tried to hit on some deep balls and just really unable to connect uh, on the deep pass, whether it's Joe Milton, whether it's Tim Hooker. Uh, so – that's been, you know, kind of the theme right now. Offensively, has been able to hit on those deep passes. Uh, defensively, these guys have kind of been a pleasant surprise. We we thought the offense would be so far ahead of the defense, but really, it's kind of been in reverse uh, at this point of the season. Yeah, let's get into the specifics a little bit. We'll start at quarterback. You mentioned Joe Milton starts the season for Tennessee. Um, he had some moments, uh, but as you said, you know, just struggling to connect on the throws down the field. Gets injured versus Pitt. Here comes Hendon Hooker, another transfer. This one from Virginia Tech. What's been the difference in the two quarterbacks, and who do you think we'll see Saturday versus Florida? Well, if I'm making the decision, uh, it's Hendon Hooker. I think what he's done offensively, given this uh, coach staff, this offense coach staff, a chance to to, to to call plays and him make plays with his with his legs because his offensive line uh, not only is 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 thin. From a depth concern, but you know they've battled some injuries too. I mean, Cooper Mays, your starting center, has been out, you know, the last two games, um, and so you've had to make some, some, some adjustments and shuffle some guys around, and uh, that's taken some players who are playing natural positions, you know, maybe a guard, uh, and having them play at center, and um, that's just that's not ideal for Tennessee. Uh, depth is a concern, so you know to have a guy like Andy Hooker. Uh, they can make plays with his feet. It reminds me a lot of 2014 Josh Dobbs when he finally took over as QB1 and kind of the, the franchise quarterback. You know, the offensive line for Tennessee in 14 was struggling early in the season, uh, but Dobbs came in and kind of made it look better than what it really was. Uh, I think Henley can do that for, for this offensive line and, and be an extension of the running game uh, from the running back position. So uh, Milton's arm, and I'm not exaggerating here, I haven't seen anyone throw the football. Uh, with the ease yeah. uh, since Jamarcus Russell. Uh, I haven't seen anything like it, to be honest. I mean, the arm strength, I haven't seen anybody in this conference. Jamarcus Russell, you can throw him, you know, Matt Stafford. But his arm his arm is ridiculous. But um, you got to throw a touch. You got to throw with anticipation. You got to throw with accuracy. Uh, it's not about just throwing, throwing hard and throwing far. He needs to find that touch, and the receivers need to find – you know, they got to find their sweet spot. The Chiefs got to do a better job as well. So, uh, but I would play Hendon. I think Hendon gives Tennessee offense right now the best chance based on the first three games. And you, you mentioned the offensive line and some of the injuries there, and that probably extends to the run game too. You know, Vols are going to have their hands full trying to, you know, run on this Florida defensive front. You had junior Tyon Evans and sophomore Jabari Small. Both guys went over 100 yards in the season opener for Tennessee. Small was injured versus Pitt, didn't play last week. Evans has dealt with an injury already as well this season. So with the injuries up front of the offensive line and and the running back position, you know, what's the outlook there for that for, for that group? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Tyon, um, I mean, he's 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 good to go. There shouldn't be any lingering issues there. Uh, as far as Jabari Small, yeah, he had a 
Um, it was like he had a shoulder deal um, in that Pittsburgh game. Uh, went off the football field with one shoulder lower than the other, an arm hanging a little bit. But uh, with rehab and, and medicine, he should be ready to go. I mean, this is Florida, so you really don't have a lot of time to be getting getting hurt and staying hurt in games like this. So, you know, I anticipate those guys to, to play, and uh, we'll see if they able to run through some holes. I think Florida did a great job of, of holding their own in the trenches against Alabama uh, last game, and so that's not going to be an easy task at all. It'll be a very tall task for Tennessee to rush the football consistently. I think that's why him and Hooker is so important. Hey, look, there's got to be some positive from this wide receiver group, a group you should you, you probably follow very close. I mean, we mentioned uh, the downfield passing there from Milton, but, hey, look, a, re- a lot of the reason he's still into these receivers is cause, uh, is cause they are open. They're open down the field. So what have you seen from that group so far? You said you'd like to see a little bit more improvement there for maybe sitting down in the zone to help the quarterback out, but you, you do see at times these guys are open. I mean, they're fast. I mean, they got speed on the outside. That was a, a theme, um, really – since the you know, previous coaching staff was yeah. the high speed at that position, and they've done that. They've done that, um, you know, before Josh Heupel. With Josh Heupel, they went into the transfer portal, and they have added some speed there. Uh, Javante Payton is a low 4-4 guy. Jalen Hyde is a low 4-3 guy. Uh, so they have speed on the outside. There's no debate in that at all. But they just got to connect. Uh, this is a young wide receiver group, and, you know, they've lost a couple guys to the league you know, over the last couple of years. And Marquez Callaway, Jawan Jennings, and Josh Palmer. Uh, now the question is, who's going to step up and kind of be the be the leader, and who's going to follow who? It's a young group with a young uh, position coach, and so I think they all kind of trying to figure it out. Uh, to to be honest, but you know they got to they got to they got to they got to make the plays. I mean, they had a couple drops. Um, everyone looked at the quarterback and pointed the finger at them. But you know you had a big drop last week. You had a Touchdown drop against Pittsburgh. This receiver, ha- this receiver group got stepped the game up. They're young, uh, but they're fast. And they can get behind the defense. There's, there's no doubt about that. Let's move to the other side here with Jason Swain, former Tennessee wide receiver from 2003-2006, joining us right here on Gators Breakdown, previewing these Tennessee volunteers. And, Jason, man, this season Tennessee's only allowing 54 54- Point three yards rushing per game, and we just saw what Florida was able to do running the ball versus Alabama. So this is the matchup of the game. I think we should watch uh, here. You know, something's going to have to give here. <laughs> so uh, what, are, what have the Vols done so well up front? You know, front seven, and is there a main player that's kind of wreaked havoc, or go, or is it more of a group effort up front for the Vols? Uh, it's going to be a group effort, I think, uh, up front for for the Vols. I mean. Uh, Defensive line coming into the season was was an area of concern, um, but you know you, you get back uh, Byron Young, who had to sit out the first two games because some you know weird eligibility stuff from his prep school, but he's Tennessee's best pass rusher along with uh, Tyler Barron and uh, Barron, uh, sophomore, has shown a ton of upside and flash uh, in a short time here at Tennessee. He just needs some help. He needs a you know he needs a sack partner. He needs a pressure partner. I think uh, Byron Young can be that for, for Tennessee. But uh, Tennessee has some experienced guys uh, up front. Not to say that they have been playing at a high level their entire career, but they play a lot of football. Uh, and so they have a sense of urgency. And they probably got the, 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 the probably the biggest position coach upgrade in the SEC, uh, getting Rodney Garner. I mean, Rodney Garner is one of the best uh, in the country. He has been awesome in the SEC for decades. Uh, you see when he did at Georgia, so he's uh, at Auburn. And so Tennessee is very fortunate to have Rodney Garner. So uh, the defensive line um, is being pushed uh, by one of the best in the business. They just gotta, they just gotta be consistent, gotta stay healthy, and they gotta play their best football uh, of the season to have a chance uh, this weekend against Florida. Let's move to the secondary as we finish up the preview here and. Jesse, you, you got to know where I'm going here. It starts with Theo Jackson. Man. That guy just seems to be everywhere on the field right now, near the top of the SEC in so many defensive categories. Man, he's he's everywhere so for, on, on the field for the Vols this season. Yeah, I mean, he he is an example of, of you know, I think sometimes fans expect the freshman to come in and, and go and be All-American the first year. And if, you're not, if he's not the first year, then the second year, people, people just wipe players off. And Theo Jackson is a guy that uh, it clicked for him. It clicked for him uh, in the spring. He understood that if it was to be, it was going to be up to him. 
and taking accountability with the transition and all the change that was going on inside this program. He looked in the mirror and said, hey, I got to be the example. I need to be the model. And uh, he just totally bought in um, and just has been consistent each and every day at practice from the spring to the fall. And it's really no surprise why he is having such a great start to the season. He's flying everywhere. He's playing fast. He's playing with confidence. He's having fun. Uh, but he's a prime example of if you just stay the course, continue to work hard, then it'll, it'll pay off. It'll pay off. So Theo's been great for Tennessee right now. He's been Tennessee's best defensive player, in my opinion. And he's, he's going to have to be great this weekend dealing with um, you know, a quarterback that can run, use his legs, and he had a pretty good day passing the football, too, uh, limiting his turnover. So Theo has his work cut out for him this weekend. All right, there we go. Great preview there of the Tennessee Volunteers from Jason Swain. Jason, let, uh, let everybody know where, where they can find you and your work you do for uh, up, there in, uh, up there in Tennessee. Well, every weekday morning, man, 7 to 10 a.m., uh, we broadcast our live show uh, there on the Swain Event app. That's free for Android, Apple devices. We stream at SwainEvent.com. Uh, we video stream the show on Twitch, Twitter, uh, Facebook Live, and on YouTube. We podcast everything. So, man, we just we just try to be available to everyone, and uh, we appreciate you know you allowing us to to come on today and, and kind of you know share what we do and preview this game. So, I appreciate the time. Thanks, Jason. Gator fans, if you want any more Tennessee coverage? That's where you go for it all. Learn more about these volunteers as. They head down to the swamp this week to take on the Gators. Jason, man, thank you so much. At any time. Thank you. Football season is also tailgating season, and there's nothing better for a tailgate than Four River Smokehouse. Believe me, I know we had them tailgate our Florida Alabama tailgate, and believe me, they delivered. Named the number one barbecue in the South by Southern Living Magazine. Four River Smokehouse is a family owned barbecue restaurant specializing in 18 hour smoked Angus brisket. I love me some brisket. I love some ribs, too. But, man, they gave us some of those sliders that they have, the pulled chicken, the pulled pork sliders. Man, so impressed there with Four River Sliders. First time I've had their sliders. I, I, I'm a I'm a ribs and brisket guy, for, but the first time I've had their sliders and they did not disappoint, I will add them into my Four Rivers rotation. But, honestly, you get those home-style sides and those fresh-baked desserts that are also so good as well. And you get that at any of Four River Smokehouse's 13 Florida locations. The Four River Party Package comes tailgate ready so you can spend more time watching the game and not the grill. Enjoy the gridiron pack for four for $54.99 or the party for 12 pack for $109. Each package includes Four Rivers award-winning barbecue meats, home-style sides, buns, and those signature barbecue sauces. Now through September 30th, take $5 off on orders of $25 or more when you're ordering in-store or by phone when you mention Gators Breakdown. So if you're heading to Gainesville this week for Florida, Tennessee, swing by Four Rivers Gainesville located in Butler Plaza. If you're tailgating at home in Gainesville, Orlando, Jacksonville, Tampa, Tallahassee areas, then you can also enjoy the best barbecue anywhere in Florida at Four Rivers Smokehouse. All right, here we go. Let's continue this Tennessee uh, volunteer preview here as they roll into the swamp on Saturday night. So the matchup for me, you heard me and Jason talk about it there, is to Florida's, Florida's rushing attack versus Duvall's rush defense. Florida ranks second in college football in rushing with 1,007 1, yards, 335.7 yards per game. Uh so, man, and eighth with uh, in total yards per game, Florida is with 552 yards. So offense is up there, led by this rushing attack, but a top eight offense in the country as well with 552.7 yards a game. Florida ranks first in the SEC in total rush yards and rushing yards per game, as well as second in the SEC in total offense. Here we go. Tennessee have held three straight opponents to start the season under 100 yards rushing in each game to start the season. But here we go. We'll give you a little bit of context on that one. Bowling Green, Tennessee's first opponent. They're averaging 58 yards a game rushing. You know, so <laughs> they play Tennessee. Tennessee does contribute to that some so, so, somewhat. But uh, they're good for about 58 yards a game. And they've played Tennessee, South Alabama, and Murray State. And they average 58 yards a game rushing. Pitt. Tennessee's toughest opponent, they're 91st in rushing offense. Of course, Tennessee does play into that a little bit, but Pitt, 91st in rushing offense at 131 yards a game. 
But get this. Pitt rushed for a whopping 75 yards last week in a loss to Western Michigan. Opponents coming to play just a little bit here. So, I'm not sure this ball's rushing defense is all the stats are telling us. If you look a little bit deeper of who they played and what those teams have done outside of Tennessee as well. Of course, Tennessee contributes to those stats, and it does help in the three-game sample size there. So, credit to Tennessee also a little bit for doing what they're supposed to do. But I think we can see here, if Florida's rushing attack is what we've seen these first three weeks, I still see, no matter what the stats say overall right now for Tennessee's rush defense, I still see a big advantage for Florida and their rushing offense. But here's some more about Tennessee defense and, the, and stats here. This season, Tennessee's allowing only 54.3 yards rushing per game, which is second in the SEC, fifth in college football. Vols allowed 141.6 yards per rushing per game a season ago, so a big improvement there, 141 Point six yards last year, only 54.3 right now. Of course, the SEC opponents saw last year as well, uh, and Jimmy Pruitt gets fired. So the defense was supposed to be a lot better, but it wasn't. So far, they are better, as at least as when you compare numbers, but we'll see what that means when they start getting into SEC play. Tennessee has issued only three rushes. Now, here, this is a good stat here. Has only issued three rushes of 10-plus yards this season. So you know, you guys know me and my explosive runs. We'll see if Florida can garner more on this Tennessee defense. Uh, but that ranks third in the nation for Tennessee. The longest rush by an opponent, a 24-yard run by Bowling Green in the season opener. Tennessee is allowing only 250, 265 yards per game in total offense uh, get for, for their opponents, which ranks 17th in the nation and fourth in the SEC. That's a 142.4-yard improvement from a year ago when Tennessee allowed 407.4 yards a game. Vols went into week three against Tennessee Tech without having forced a takeaway. The defense started forcing some takeaways last week. None before last week, and that changed quickly as they intercepted four passes last week versus Tennessee Tech. Tennessee has racked up 29 tackles for loss. That's where the big, you know, I think plays into their rush defense a good bit. Uh, 29 tackles for loss through three games under their new defensive coordinator, Tim Banks, uh, ranked seventh in the nation and third in the SEC behind LSU and Auburn. And look, they've responded well to some sudden change when their offense is putting them in a the bad position. Two to three games so far for Tennessee, they've not allowed a point on an ensuing opponent possession following a ball turnover. Against Pitt, they've only allowed three points following a sudden change turnover. So they're doing good with their defense when their offense puts them in bad positions. Five of Tennessee's six turnovers have occurred in its own territory, and out of those five, the Vol defense has only allowed three points versus Pitt there. So, I know, if yeah, Florida's going to get turnovers, which I hope we see more of this game, you're going to have to do something with it. And you got a defense that's been well prepared so far in their three games of not giving up a score when their opponent puts them in or when their offense puts them in a bad position. Third down defense has been a strength. Florida's not been too strong on third down this year. Uh, third down defense for Tennessee. Opponents have converted only 14 of 51 opportunities. That's good for 27.45%. That ranks second in the SEC and 12th in the country. So, you know, there are some good things to point to for this Tennessee defense, but they haven't seen an attack like Florida's yet. Uh, I think opponents have played more so into it than anything else, but we'll see. We'll see. They, they, they've done what they're supposed to do, and that's what we I said about the Florida offensive line uh, going up to, you know, the first couple games before Tennessee or before the Alabama game. It was, well, at least you were doing what you were supposed to do against those weaker opponents, and it translated for Florida. We'll see if that translates for Tennessee as well. Uh, but yeah, they have not seen an attack like Florida's yet, even close to it yet. Uh, so, look, you heard me. We'll go to one player to watch here. You heard me earlier with Jason. The player to watch here, senior Theo Jackson. And I'm going to give you a stat rundown of what this kid's doing. Defensive back uh, for Tennessee, one of the best, SEC's best so far through three weeks. Uh, Jackson leads the Vols in tackles from a defensive back position. Now, leads the Vols in tackles with 25. Tackles for loss with six. So that's where I said you, you could say, well, that means their up front's not playing well because uh, a secondary guy's having a lot of tackles. No, they, they, they put him in the box. They, they move him around. I mean, he leads the Vols in tackles for loss as well with six. 
one and a half sacks, five pass breakups as well. So he is all over the field. He is tied for, tied for the SEC lead in tackles for loss and is tied for fifth in all of college football with his tackles for loss being six there. He leads all college football defensive backs in tackles for loss, all FBS defensive backs in tackles for loss. Ranks fifth in the SEC in total tackles. He is tied for 51st in FBS there, tied for the lead uh, in SEC for pass breakups, six in FBS, and he's tied a career high with 11 tackles in each of his first two games this season. It was the first time in his career he registered double-digit tackles in back-to-back games. His 25 tackles were the most by a volunteer through the first three games of the season since Daniel Batuli had 33 of the first three games in 2018. So there you go. That's your player you have to key in on on, on with Florida's own offense, Tennessee's own defense. Theo Jackson there, a senior there uh, for Tennessee. Look out for him to be all over the field and make his presence felt on that vol defense. So there's you look at the Tennessee defense and where I think Florida has an advantage. I really do. I think Florida has a pretty good advantage there uh, on on that Tennessee defense. I know the numbers say that they have a pretty good rush defense and that lends itself to an overall um, um, overall numbers that are up there as well. You guys know I'm a stat guy. I'm a numbers guy, but you got to be able to to break it down a little bit more and the opponents just don't stack up to what Florida is. But maybe, maybe the, like I keep going back to Florida's offensive line and, and improving it. Maybe it translates for Tennessee as well. So there's you look at the Tennessee defense. I think Florida has an advantage, and it starts up front. I think Florida's offensive line just – after seeing what they did versus Alabama last week, if they, they just have to keep it up. They just have to keep it up uh, there up front for the Gators. Now on to the Vols offense, and we have to start there at a point where Florida defensive coordinator Todd Grantham has struggled in recent years. Why has he struggled in recent years? A lot of it's tempo. I mean, it's a trademark of Tennessee head coach Josh Hopper and his offenses, all of that tempo he brings to the table. Vols are averaging 3.08 offensive plays per minute, which is tops in the country. They are the fastest offense in the country right now. Utah State is next closest. Tennessee is tallying 77.67 plays per game. That is 13th in college football two things already brought up already this is where offense have two things offenses this is where they've been able to get the Todd Grantham and get the best of Todd Grantham which leads me to my second point starting better on defense it's going to be tough with this up-tempo offense for Tennessee we've seen Florida start slow and tempo has a lot to do with it and most of the time my argument there is against the better offenses on the schedule but that's not what Tennessee is. Tennessee's not going to be one of the better offenses Florida faces. But that's why you can't let the tempo of this offense get the best of you early. Mullen mentioned having to get settled in on defense versus Alabama, but that that that, that cannot be a reoccurring theme in allowing offenses to get out to fast starts and put your own offense in a hole to start with. Can Grant them respond? And can him and the players hit the ground running in practice this week? to make sure a faster start happens. You know what Tennessee is going to do. This up-tempo, you may have been caught off guard by some teams running up-tempo on you. No, that's, this is Josh Heupel's MO. You cannot be caught off guard by this, that, by, by, by this up-tempo offense. Tennessee doesn't have the athletes Alabama has to, to, to get off to that kind of start, but they may have the scheme, and that's where you have to worry here uh, with, with Todd Grantham and, and, and the tempo hurting his defense. Uh, if the defense doesn't improve on that weakness, Plenty of blame to go around on that issue last week. And Kyrie Elam says starting fast on defense. He said it this week in a press conference that starting fast will come through practice this week. He mentions, and they know, open field tackling was an issue. They need to execute Grantham's game plan, execute the play calls, and make tackles. You know, So he felt Grantham put them in position to make plays. Quote, it's all up to us. So we'll see how, both, how well both coaches and players respond. More so for the players – in the regard of tackling and, and and go out there and actual you know actually perform early in the game. That's where you got hurt last week. There were times Grantham put you in position and you didn't make the tackle. But well, I think we go historically and look at Todd Grantham, and that's where this tempo has hurt him. So I think historically you're looking for Todd Grantham to get off to a better start because of the tempo. But you're based off of last week, you're looking for the players to get off to a better start, basically just based on pure performance out there and needing to make the plays. So let's look at this Tennessee offense just a little bit more. 
and they're used to a fast start. So here we go. This is where I keep pounding this fast start uh, over and over again. Tennessee has outscored opponents 38 to nothing in the first quarter of this season. The Vols are one of two SEC teams yet to surrender a point in the first quarter, the other one being Arkansas. Uh, the scoring differential in the first quarter, offense minus defense, is plus 12.67, which is tied for second in the country with Houston. Alabama leads the country after last week, of course. That's going to that, that's, that's gonna go pretty far. Alabama leads the nation at plus 14 scoring differential in the first quarter. That's what the average is through three games. Tennessee second with plus 12.67. Opponent, then this is a crazy stat. You know, it's kind of going back to the Tennessee defense, but helping their offense at the same time. Opponents are only managing 39.7 yards of total offense in the first quarter versus Tennessee this season. So you're looking for the Florida offense to get off to a better start start, start as well. Uh, so, but that lets you know offense and and how they're getting off to their fast starts and, and they're building leads because of uh, their performance on both sides of the ball. So you look at uh, Tennessee quarterback position. The deep pass with Milton is what you have to worry about if he plays uh, and if he can finally hit them with any kind of consistency there. That's been the big issue for this Tennessee offense so far this year when he's been on the field and been the quarterback. The receivers are getting behind the coverage, but Milton just, as you mentioned, or as you heard Swain mention, the, his arm is live, and it's most of the time because he's overthrowing. It's not that he's accurate left, right most of the time. It's just because he's overthrowing them. Uh, there's very little touch on those throws. 5.4 yards per play ranks 88th in the country. They give up tackles for loss and sacks uh, in games versus FBS opponents, Bowling Green and Pitt, the first couple games of the season. Tennessee has given up four sacks, good for 115th in the country, uh, and uh, ranked 120th in turnovers, giving up the ball two and a half times per game versus Bowling Green and Pitt. So, you know, all that's compared to everybody else playing FBS opponents too. So that's uh, lacking there for Tennessee. Giving up – Tackles, sacks for loss, turning the ball over as well. Ranked 120th in turnovers, giving up the ball two and a half times per game versus FBS opponents. Ooh. So here's the thing about that, though. It's mostly fumbles. So we'll see if that still stays consistent. Uh, interceptions are more consistent most of the time in the turnover game than fumbles. But Tennessee ranks 128th in fumbles given away. We're giving away two in a game. So their turnovers are putting the ball on the ground. So I think what you have to look for there, if Florida continues this havoc up front and is just everywhere and bowling people over and making tackles and behind the line of scrimmage, I do think there's something to watch for. If Tennessee is going to – if they're going to keep showing the consistency of putting the ball on the ground and Florida keeps showing, showing the consistency of creating havoc in the backfield, maybe Florida can continue that trend for one more week. Only way I see Tennessee winning this game is to consistently hit those big plays, which they haven't done so yet or if this tempo just gets the best of Grantham and they're, they're, they're scoring at will. Uh, I think Florida may start a little slow again <laughs> and, and, until they get used to this tempo a little bit, but that's my thing. You know what's coming. You got to prepare. And it's hard, it's hard to prepare for. Don't get me wrong. I know that. Um, but there are things you can do in practice to, to kind of help simulate that. And you go back to the 08 National Championship game and uh, – <laughs> you know, hypo in that Oklahoma background uh, there, but the speed of that and how Florida practiced with two offenses on the field at the same time for that defense where they had to run the one offense and run to the other offense to get used to the speed of that Oklahoma was going to play for. Very similar here. Bring something like that back to get ready for the speed of the, the uh, Tennessee offense there. That's about the only way I see them winning this game is just that if that tempo was too much game after game after game. But, you know, come on. I mean, Tennessee hasn't been able to do it. All that great versus their first three opponents. Florida's defense is going to have to step up here uh, as well. Florida's much better up front than Tennessee's opponent so far. And I don't Tennessee. I don't think Tennessee can pass their way to a win. That's what it will take. They won't run on Florida. It's going to take a performance in the passing attack. I think Florida's just too strong up front, too much pressure up front uh, as well. All that havoc, Florida, I think, puts all, all that put together. I'm going with a 40-20 to 20 victory for the Gators. I think, and look, this is, I'm going to go back to the Florida offense just a little bit too. And I mentioned the rushing attack uh, for Florida and how that can make a difference here. But I think this might be a chance for those big plays to come alive in the Florida passing attack. It's out there on film now how Florida runs the ball, how well Florida runs the ball. I think Tennessee's defense would, so far, with who they've played, they've been able to stop the run. And I think they're going to make a priority early on to stop this Florida run game. I think Florida should be able to establish the run anyway, but. 
Now I think the chance is there for some big plays that happen in the passing game because teams are going to be keen on that Florida run game. The big playability might be more open now in the passing game based on that. More chances for some big plays in the passing game will be there early because of it, early in the game. So that's what I'm looking for for this Florida offense. Some big plays early on in the game when Tennessee is going to be focusing on stopping that Florida run game. Here we go. Hendon Hooker, Jim Milton, doesn't matter who's that quarterback for Tennessee. Not good enough to press in the passing game, I don't think. They'll have their chances to make some big plays uh, as well, but they Tennessee won't be able to protect well any for uh, enough consistency to make a difference. Now, I, w- I would watch if Hooker plays more. I think he can dink his dunk away his way down the field a little more, a little more accurate there than Milton. So he can dink and dunk his way down the field um, when Tennessee you know spread spreads Florida out a little bit. But that's where you got to get improvement. You heard Kyer Elam mention open field tackling. That's going to be an emphasis this week in practice. Florida has to get better in that regard. Um, first couple of weeks, you know, tackling was better, angles bad. That's what led to some tackles. It all came together ahead when Alabama, when you play a, a different opponent and those type of athletes. Tennessee doesn't have that those type of athletes, but they have better athletes than USF and FAU. So tackle in open space. Uh, and look, the biggest thing, of course, we all go back to it, the Bama hangover. Can't let it happen. The leaders need to step up this week. Make, the coaching staff needs to step up this week. Uh, it's on the players uh, more so this week. You know, I, <laughs> I don't think the Bama hangover or, or any kind of hangover usually – bleeds over to the coaching staff, usually bleeds over to the players uh, there. But you have to have the coaching staff to, to kind of tap into the players there uh, and make sure at least help the players along the way. It is up to the players, but you can help them on, along the, uh, the, the way a little bit. Intensity and practice. You know, Florida's probably a pretty sore team right now <laughs> after Alabama. But there's a lot of talk of that Bama hangover, and I, and I tweeted this out this week. But remember, go back to last year, and we thought Florida had an advantage of playing Texas A&M the week after Texas A&M played Alabama. Well, Texas A&M goes on to beat a pretty good Florida team, and then it goes on to have a pretty good season the week after they lost to Alabama last year. So that's the kind of response needed from Florida this week. And the, the, There is a such thing as a Bama hangover, but you don't have to let it affect you. Texas A&M didn't last year. You can turn around. That's kind of the response. That's the kind of response Florida needs this year as well. So 40 to 20 Gators, that's what I have. Um, I just think we're, we're, I think where Tennessee is a little strong, I just think it matches up well for Florida. They do have a strong run defense so far this season, but I don't. Their defense isn't better now. I mean, give Alabama those opponents and uh, that Tennessee just had, and probably would have had some very similar results. Florida ran on that Bama team anyway, but you got to get up to play for the game. You got to get hyped up to play for the game, and that that's where I think. The focus should probably be for Florida. But at least on the field, I think Florida can have some big plays early in the passing game. Rely on the run game. I'm not saying abandon the run game at all. I think you should still run the ball early. But I do think there will be some chances early on for some big passing plays there for the Gators. All right, one more topic before we get off here on Gators breakdown. And, of course, that is looking around the SEC this week. And conference play starting up even more now. You had it last week just a bit, of course, with – Florida, Alabama headline in that, but more, more conference games this week. Starting at noon, Georgia travels to Vanderbilt on the SEC Network. Another nooner, LSU and Mississippi State. Remember, that was the season opener last year for both of those two teams. LSU loses that game when they are uh, coming off their national championship there. So I'm sure there's going to be some kind of revenge factor uh, going on in that one. But LSU uh, have a lot of revenge after last year, of course. But uh, we'll see where that one goes. But um you also have another nooner on ESPN2, Missouri and Boston College. Pretty good little hour conference matchup there uh, for Missouri and Boston College. And then the other big SEC neutral site game, you have Florida, Georgia, and Jacksonville, and you have Texas A&M and Arkansas in Dallas. And what a surprise that game is now, <laughs> fourth week of the season, Texas A&M and Arkansas. Now, we thought Texas A&M would be in this regard, or high, you know, ranked high in this regard, and uh, headline this game anyway, but now Arkansas with their big win over Texas a couple weeks ago, ranked number 16th in the country. So you have number seven, Texas A&M, with some quarterback, Haynes King, not starting now. And then Arkansas, kind of a hot team right now as well, ranked 16. So you have a top 20 matchup here in the SEC at 3.30 on CBS. Auburn, after coming off their loss to Penn State, will host Georgia State. Then at 7 o'clock, of course, under the lights in Gainesville, Tennessee travels to the Swamp to take on number 11, Florida. That game is on ESPN if you're not in the swamp. 
Also at 7 p.m., Kentucky and South Carolina at ESPN2, Florida's opponent for next week is the Kentucky Wildcats. So playing at the same time as Florida, so you might want to have that on the other monitor, your other TV, your other iPad, computer, however you want to watch the second game. I uh, recommend putting that one up at the same time. And then 7.30, Southern Miss travels to Tuscaloosa to take on number one, Alabama. So there's your look at the SEC this week. Some good games. I'm really looking forward to that uh, Texas a and Arkansas game. Uh, that's a, still a really good Aggie defense, and we'll see what Arkansas can bring to the table uh, there in basically that Kentucky and South Carolina game. Should be a easier win for Kentucky. Uh, South Carolina's not that great this year. A week before Florida, we'll see if they're kind of maybe looking ahead there. But uh, if you guys did miss it this week, that it will be a night game, Florida versus Kentucky next week. It will either be a 6 o'clock kickoff on ESPN or a 7 o'clock kickoff on SEC Network, I believe. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, of course, probably something to do with the results of this week before they uh, nail down the start time for that one. But it will be a night game, another night game in Lexington when Florida travels there. So uh seems like that game is always a night game there in Lexington, especially on SEC Network recently as well uh, there. So, all right, that will do it for this episode of Gators Breakdown, previewing the Tennessee Volunteers. I am your host, of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown. Gators Breakdown.